Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk to Dr. Michael Millerman. You are most welcome, sir. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to see you. Uh, Michael Milliman is an award-winning political philosophy scholar and a teacher. Uh, he earned his PhD in political science from the University of Toronto uh, for his work on Heidegger and political theory. And his first uh, book, beginning with Heidegger, Strauss, Rorty, Derrida, Dugin, and the Philosophical Constitution of the Political, has been called An Essential Guide to Passionate Thinking. And is my uh, copy of it. I think it's based uh, on his, on your PhD uh, doctorate dissertation, in fact. Um, That's right. But it's actually, yeah, it's actually uh, very readable, um, surprisingly. Um, Michael has also been uh, called, well, he is one of the, the foremost experts on Alexander Dugin, uh, whom some have called, quote, the most dangerous philosopher in the world, unquote. Several of whose books he has actually translated from uh, Russian. Now, he's also the author of Inside Putin's Brain, that's a great title, The Political Philosophy of Alexandra Dugin. Now, Michael has kindly agreed to discuss Alexandra Dugin's latest book, and this is my copy here, The Great Awakening versus The Great Reset, uh, which I've read. It's actually the shortest book I've ever <laughs> read, but um, what it lacks in length, it more than makes up for in intense content. Um, could you uh, begin by explaining who Dugan is uh, and why he is so controversial in the West? Because he really is controversial in some circles in the West, I think. Yes. Yeah, so Alexander Dugan is a Russian philosopher, ideologue and activist. He's the author of over 50 books, some of which have been translated into English, but many of which remain untranslated. And he came into media prominence in the Western world, I would say, in 2014 with Russia's annexation of Crimea, because at that time, it looked as though Putin was implementing a geopolitical and ideological program that Dugin had masterminded. So there were articles that came out, for example, um, called, uh, you know, Putin's brain. That term came out in 2014 mm -hmm. when a foreign affairs magazine made the case that to really understand what Putin is doing, you have to look to Dugin's writings and Dugin's plans for Russia, which he's been developing for a long time. Uh, Dugin has a vision of Russia's place in the world, a vision of a multipolar world where you're not just going to have global American liberalism, but rather some sort of response to it on all fronts, which we'll discuss because it's one of the main themes of this book. Uh, another reason that Dugin is controversial besides the fact that he is uh, masterminding an anti-liberal anti-Western, you could say, political program, is that sometimes he has said things that are very uh, troubling for Western defenders of human rights, mm. of uh, LGBT rights, of democracy promotion, and things like that. So mm. he tends to consider all of that quite negatively. And um, people can fasten upon a few of the most radical versions of his opposition to those basic values and principles, blow them out of proportion, or perhaps you know shine a spotlight on them, depending on how you want to interpret that, mm -hmm. and uh, paint him as the devil incarnate, uh, which is basically mm -hmm. what he tries to do from his perspective when he looks at American liberalism, paint it as the devil incarnate. But that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's really about his reputation there. Uh, I should say one other thing, that Dugan is a theorist not only for Russian, anti-Western, anti-liberalism. He also has exported a model that is kind of general in its applicability. So sometimes he's seen as the mastermind of a global neo-Nazi, neo-fascist uh, front. And in that sense, people who worry about the rise of European populism or who worry about some other form of authoritarianism, they say, look at this guy, he's influencing everybody. They're all his acolytes. Uh, he's mm -hmm. at the he's at the root in some sense Gosh. for his critics. But he, he is a, he is in in his work a, a great critic and rejecter of Nazism and fascism. He specifically says National Socialist Germany and Fascist Italy are not models. They're in the history. They're in the past, along with communism. These are the kind of twin uh, systems that he routinely condemns and says now we're in a different place and the enemy for him uh, is what he calls liberalism and liberalism is really the evil i mean he uses the word evil of liberalism doesn't he yes yeah, so one of the most common difficulties in interpreting and assessing dugan's thought in my view 
is that he rejects liberalism, but also, as you said, the historical alternatives to it, most mm. prominently communism and fascism. And so he has an idea that he's well known for among people who know of him. His idea is the fourth political theory, mm. neither liberal nor communist nor fascist. Exactly. Uh, is, now, the difficulty. Is, uh, yeah. pa pardon me. So I was just saying, this is the uh, the, the text uh, published uh, some years ago uh, that talks about the four political theory. If you want to find out more about what he actually thinks. Yeah, that's right. So the difficulty is that people as a rule who don't accept Dugan's model, who still operate within the three political theories, they say, mm -hmm. OK, Dugan is not a liberal. Therefore, he's either a communist. And there are some people who accuse him of that. Or he's a fascist slash Nazi. And there's some people who accuse him of that. So mm. if those are your only categories of interpretation, and clearly he's an anti-liberal, he has to be some combination. So I'll give you another perfect example of this. There was a time when he was the founder of a movement in Russia, a party, in fact, called a national Bolshevism. So yeah. that also, you're like anti-liberal, so you put together the mm. other two political theories and you get national, that's the third political theory, Bolshevist, mm. that's the second political theory. But uh, but it's true that today and a lot of people, including intelligent university professors who work on political theory and political philosophy, they have a hard time wrapping their heads around the fact that he is explicitly, consistently and genuinely, in my view, anti-fascist mm. because they think that anti-fascism implies embrace of global de democratic liberalism. But in oh. his case, it doesn't. In his case, you can be against both of them. And he is. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the most fascinating discussions in uh, Putin's uh, recent book, The Great Awakening versus The Great Reset, um, is his discussion of the, the history of liberalism from what he calls nominalism all the way to globalism and President Biden. Now, it never occurred to me until reading Dugan that liberal ideology uh, had its roots in the thought of the English philosopher uh, William of Ockham. Now, he's, of course, most famous for the Occam's razor, this parsimonious idea. We're not going to go into that. But what, what is nominalism? Because this theme constantly reappears in this book. Nominalism is the taproot of this evil flower that's blossomed into uh, uh, globalism, President Biden, uh, and all these evils uh, that associated with liberalism. What is nominalism and why is it such a, a bad thing for him? So the way that Dugan presents it in the book is that we have a dispute, a medieval dispute among theologians and philosophers, over the ontological status of universals. So mm. if I say, for example, that uh, here's a horse, there's a horse, okay, three horses. Mm. Now, only the particular horse exists or does the category of horse also exist? Does the general category or the general a grouping, the species or whatever the case is, the idea of the horse, does that also exist? So is a debate over the existence of universals. Are right. only particulars real or are universals also real? And the idea here is that nominalism came down on the side that only particulars are real, that universals are a function not of what exists, but of what we say. So nominalism suggests that universalism is a function just of the act of naming, in effect. Mm -hmm that the only reality is the individual. And yeah, Dugan takes- it's like Just the word nominal there then becomes operational because it's just nominal, it's, it's not real. They're called, you talk about the, the, the genus of horses. It's not a, a concept that exists independently of the mind like Plato might have thought. We only really have individual horses. So it's a nominal use of language. And that's where the word nominalism comes in. Is that right? Yeah, so it may seem, yeah, so it may seem trivial in the case of horses, but now take it in a more platonic direction and look at the case, for example, of beauty, of justice, of the good. So we call something things beautiful we say this is a beautiful house a beautiful car what about beauty itself mm. now plato argued he had socrates argue in the republic that in that sense universals like the idea of beauty the idea of justice they are real they're more real than the individual realities they yeah. have they're more beingful beings yeah. nominalism doesn't uh the Occam's the idea of Occam's razor here is we're not going to duplicate entities. We're not going to posit the universal horse in addition to the particular horse. We take our razor, we cut out the universal, and we're left with the particular. We have fewer entities. We haven't had to multiply entities. That's the sense there of Occam's razor. So mm -hmm. 
Dugan looks at this and you could say he sees nominalism as a kind of thoroughgoing anti-Platonism, a thoroughgoing anti-universalism. And there are many implications and consequences that follow from that basic reorientation. Now, something interesting, I was doing a bit of research myself on this topic uh, yesterday in preparation for our discussion. I found an article from 1935 um, by this person named Julius Friend. I can send it to you if you want to link it in the video. And he Mm -hmm. also made the case that, just like Dugan did, that in economics, in politics, in theology, in morality, and in all of these different spheres, nominalism lies at the root of the thrust towards individualism and the movement away from a sense of any overarching um, shared reality. So just that there's some precedent for Dugan's argument is what I mean. But yeah, the way that he develops it in the book is that this principle of individualism, it begins to attack group identities, common identities, and shared external authority. So it goes against the church, it goes against the anything that stands in the way of the individual and it stands in the way of the primacy of the individual. Mm. The way that it gets from this dispute over universals and the mm. rejection you could say of Platonism all the way to Joe Biden, the Democratic Party and the Great Reset, mm. the idea is that contemporary liberalism is a continuation of this project of liberation from collective identity. Oh. Except that whereas in the past it was kind of straightforward and we've inherited this in a sense that, you know, we're rejecting certain forms of uh, patriarchy or rejecting certain forms of uh, church hierarchy. Today's forms of collective identity, as you saw that Dugan considers most relevant for global liberalism, are gender identity. Right. So the idea of transgenderism is a liberation from belonging to gender as a universal identity. So it's just a consistent application there that the individual is liberated even from gender identity. And then a step further that the individual has to be liberated even from human identity Mm -hmm. because human is also a collective notion, right? Mm -hmm. So Ultimately, the individual becomes only nominally human and therefore possibly transhuman or possibly posthuman. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, continuation. And on the flip side, um, and apologies for the long uh, response here, but on the on the flip side, the idea is that the forces of the Great Reset today, they see as their enemies anybody who is asserting any kind of collective identity. So the traditional family, the traditional nation, uh, belonging to a culture or civilization, defending your Mm -hmm. history, your destiny, of course, any sort of religious belonging that doesn't see um, God and the spirit and the angels as just merely a function of naming, but sees them as realities. All of that is right in the crosshairs of the Great Reset, because all that stands in the way of the liberation of the individual from collective identity. Well, that's an you know, extremely succinct uh, uh, summary. Um, and thank, thank you for that. I just want to point out the very beginning of uh, the book. Uh, uh, Prince Charles uh, gets mentioned, or King Charles III, as he now is. Um, in fact, at the World Economics Forum in Davos, which I think is in Switzerland, um, Prince of Wales, as he then was, proclaimed a new course for humanity, the Great Reset. This is where this phrase keeps on coming from. It's on the title of the book, of course. And then Charles outlines five points, which I, I won't read out. But they alarmed a lot of people, apparently, Uh, the Trumpists, the popularists in the United States, uh, in Europe and so on, who felt that this was the beginning of a new, to use another term, a new world order, a kind of globalist reset, which would which would enforce in a totalitarian way certain liberal understandings of what it is to be human, um, uh, essentialist understandings of gender are definitely uh, completely ruled out. But then he goes on, uh, Dugan, to talk about something which... um, I didn't quite grasp his his fear beyond this um, uh, kind of wokeist ideology. He talks about transhumanism, this next stage, which he sees on the horizon uh, coming in the future. It's not quite here yet with cyborgs and technology and the destruction of even the concept of humanity itself, what it means to be human, the deconstruction of humanity. What what is he talking about there? I mean, is this, uh, I mean, one could say quite easily, this is alarmist, this is uh, fear-mongering. What what is the basis for this? But why is he so troubled by the prospect of this new liberal epoch, which will bring further destruction on, on these values he holds so dear? So the idea here is that he's looking at the principle of the liberation of the individual from collective 
forms of identity is looking at this basic principle again having traced it to its medieval roots and played it out across various sectors like economics uh, mm. morality and so on and he says if we carry this principle through to its logical conclusion at some point we will face the fact that to be human is also a collective identity mm. human is like we had various horses and then we had you know being a horse as a kind of collective identity occam's razor cut that out so now we have various particular individuals we have being human as a collective identity occam's razor has to come in and cut that out as well so the idea here is that if we're truly free from all collective identities then we're free as well from the identity of being human and the liberation of the individual means liberating us to say yes or no to human to the identity of being human wow. we're truly free only if we're free to embrace our transhumanism our post-humanism in some sense becoming a machine is the full expression of liberation from collective identity so dugan writes about that kind of thing as well let me just take a, a step back here some mm. time ago let's say 50 years ago it might have seemed absurd that transgenderism would become the somehow a key pillar of the ruling ideology mm. Yeah. which okay we don't want to like, over exaggerate its proportion but in some sense it's a key pillar of the ruling ideology because to identify as a man or a woman is a kind of essentialism but essences are not consistent with nominalism to say mm -hmm. that something has an essence is to sort of fix its identity and to deprive it of the freedom to go beyond whatever we say its mm -hmm. essence is so here we are in a world where that kind of reasoning happens and we're subject to it and we see it, you know, the inability to say about a transgender athlete, for example, that, that there's something, you know, something about that that doesn't add up. Well, Dugan is, again, just taking the principle, uh, extrapolating it. He sees some of the seeds of posthumanism, transhumanism in the philosophy and in the practice of today, but it's not a full blown reality yet. But he says there will be a time where just like if you support, let's say, Trump, you're accused of as being a fascist. If you support authoritarian regimes as an alternative to global liberalism, you're accused of being a fascist. Dugan predicts there will be a time where if you say I'm human, you'll be accused of as being fascist and that democracy will be on the side of posthumanism and transhumanism. So that's the um, that's the basic idea. It seems far fetched, but I mm -hmm. think at the at the level of the extrapolation of the basic principle, it's consistent. Yes, I suppose it's consistent with emergent technologies and g genetic, uh, you know, interference with uh, uh, the human body. You can see some of these indications, perhaps pointing in that direction. And obviously, uh, I certainly hope that they don't come to fruition. It's a very disturbing, dystopian uh, vision. Um, I, I want to just add. Can I just add one thing here, really quickly? Sorry, I want to just make a point. People may find it interesting. I've always found it to be a helpful framing of this issue. So, mm -hmm. on one side, you may have people who defend human as a biological as a biological entity. They defend man and woman as biological categories, and they say, you know, this posthumanism, transhumanism stuff is kind of crazy. Like it's te it's mm -hmm. technologism run amok. There's yeah. nothing to it, even in principle. In fact, it's not so straightforward because. There's something in the human being that seems to transcend our animal nature. There's something in the human being that seems to transcend our biological nature. There's mm. some freedom in us that goes beyond the mere biological um, animality of our existence. Mm. And we're in a tradition that has tried to amplify that, that little part of our freedom that transcends our biology. At some point, you can see it not just as transcending the biology, but as opposed to it, as wanting to master the biology, as only really being free when it can break the link and then exert a kind of a tyranny over biology or mastery over biology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, animals, I like to say, don't commit suicide. They don't have a sense of their existential freedom vis-a-vis -vis their biology. Man, though, does have some sense of that. So it's not like a far-fetched uh, issue somehow existentially or philosophically to think about the relationship between technology, biology, and freedom. Mm. But the answer that we have to use technology to master and ultimately to overcome or to destroy our human essence is not the only way to look at that question. It's not the only answer to give to it. Mm -hmm. in, in Dugan's view, it's the wrong answer to give to it. It's the, that's the road to the destruction of the human being. 
Um, yeah. But the seeds of it are present if we reflect on what it means in some sense to be free. Yes, I, I think many would say traditional Christians, traditional Jews, traditional Muslims would say, would say that you know the genie is being let out of the bottle in the West, and it's it's not in any way constrained by revelation or traditional values. It's whatever can happen, might happen, is conceivable. Well, you know what, one day it should happen, perhaps. You know that it's not it's not in any way controlled uh, or subordinate to a higher power. Um, no, I'm sure. I'm sure uh, uh, Dugan often references uh, Evola, Julius Evola, as well, and uh, in in his writings, who uh, had that notion of tradition. I think being a guide to humanity, and we seem to be free of that in the West. Indeed, very anti-tradition, uh, and then this seems to be a you know what what, what uh, if it's unguided, it can go both very badly or or better still. But we don't really know where we're going because we don't have this guidance to lead us forward. Yeah, so that's a big part, I think, of Dugan's opposition to these tendencies. Mm. He wants to restore some of the traditional, some of the philosophical, some of the inherited and time-tested mm. um, uh, guardrails. Because, yeah. yes, w without them, we put ourselves into the hands of forces that, you know, let's, to put it mildly, may or may not be good, may or may not be in our interest, you know, may or may not be um, where we want to go. So when he when he discusses what's going on today, he says we need a restoration of literature, of philosophy, of religion, mm -hmm. because the Great Reset has tried to remove. It's not just that we find ourselves in a situation where we don't have guardrails. We have been put into a situation by people who have destroyed the guardrails deliberately, in, in his mm -hmm. view, you know, as a continuation of this principle, because Part of the idea of liberation is liberation from guardrails, liberation from um, from the straight and narrow, liberation from anything that can give a human life direction, uh, meaning and purpose, mm -hmm. other than the one that goes to ultra emancipation. Mm. And th this particular kind of uh, theme seems to be very Eurocentric to do with the historical context and the evolution of European history. So we had the medieval period, which already alluded to, and then the revolt against that, not just with the Reformation, but the Enlightenment, rationalism, uh, uh, the French Revolution in 1789, explicitly anti-religion, anti-clerical, which pushed religion out of the public domain. And it's still an issue, obviously, in France today. Uh, but this is a very, this is a European drama, European trauma, almost like an internecine civil war going on within Western Europe. It's not Russia's problem. It's not China's problem. It's not the Muslim world's problem, although it's become that or becoming that because of the hegemony of the West through its cultural, political and military institutions. So what started as a local issue has become a defining issue for humanity. And, and, and even for Russia, which is not part of this, in orthodoxy in the East, they didn't go through this trauma of revolt from the Catholic Church, the reassertion of human dignity and reason. You know, orthodoxy had its own way of dealing with that. Yeah, that's an absolutely crucial point because you have here a few things happening at once. You have the universalization or the universal projection of mm. European history. Exactly. In a way that it doesn't apply in these other cases. And that means that these other places, for Dugan, primarily other civilizations, they have a two-step operation. Number one, they have to reject the projection of universal Western uh, political modernity onto their playing field. So that's number one. You know, they fight back against the unipolar global hegemony. And then the second step is to encourage all of the different civilizations to figure out for themselves if they haven't already, to express for themselves if they haven't already, and incidentally for Westerners to start to pay attention to these other places if they haven't already, in order to see how they themselves conceive of their own history, of their historical trajectory, of their existential dramas. So for example, he says you have Fukuyama's idea that there's been a end of, end of history with liberal democracy. Dugan says when he analyzes the Russian question, not only is Russia not at the end of its history, it's not even at the start of its history in some sense. Mm -hmm. If you consider history as the history of philosophy, because for Dugan, philosophy, properly speaking, Russian philosophy hasn't yet be, hasn't yet begun. Uh, that's a whole, he's got a book on that, uh, untranslated. I've translated some of it, but I can't release it yet because of the sanctions under him, um, even though I write about it in some of my other books. So this idea that, for example, um, some places have their own modernity, but it's mm. not the same as Western modernity. Yeah. Some places are at the beginning of their history. There are going to be as many different histories as there are cultures and civilizations in the world. Oh. But right now, all of that is moot because right now, geopolitically, ideologically, philosophically, 
you have the de facto projection of the European drama on the rest of the world. So that's the first step to roll that back. Now, obviously, some people don't want to roll it back. They want to finish the job so that, you know, the projection yeah. becomes a one to one identification globally. Yeah. But uh, that, in some sense, is another way of looking at what is the Great Awakening versus the Great Reset. If the Great Reset succeeds, then that history, the European history, becomes the def the end of that history becomes the end of world history. Somehow everybody gets assimilated into the West's particular drama. The Great Awakening is we get liberated from that local drama and the possibility of a genuine, uh, authentic destiny gets awakened for all of the peoples uh, and all of the civilizations uh, mm. as they see fit. Fascinating. I, I just wanted to quote uh, just one paragraph, uh, page 16 of, of, of this extraordinary uh, book, um, which talks about the opposition uh, uh, presented by the West, by the forces of what he would call globalism and liberalism to those who dissent from it. Um, all who oppose them uh, in their eyes, these are the forces of darkness, their eyes being the West's eyes, I suppose, um, by this logic, the enemies of the open society must be dealt with in their own severi in their in their own severity. If the enemy does not surrender, he must be destroyed. And then Dugan writes, the enemy is anyone who questions liberalism, globalism, individualism, nominalism in all their manifestations. This is the new ethic of liberalism. It's nothing personal. Everyone has the right to be liberal, but no one has the right to be anything else. <laughs> and th that I, I like the rhetoric there. Everyone has a right to be liberal. Of course you do. But no one has the right to. It's like the Henry Ford thing. You can have any color of car you like as long as it's black. <laughs> that was the kind of attributed to Henry Ford. And it kind of ideologically they say, of course, there's a liberal society. You can believe in anything you want as long as it's liberalism. <laughs> um, but on the, on the darker side, um, there is there is rhetoric um, also, I think, by Dugan, which uh, uh, will surely worry many people uh, in the West. And I think you've already alluded to this, but it's, it's found on page 69 in one of the appendixes. And I'll just read the paragraph. I think it'd be fairly self-evident. So first of all, he writes, we need to fight liberalism. We need to bring this lasting decay to the end. We need to overcome liberalism. We need to finish with liberalism with the open society, with human rights, with all the products of this Soros-style liberal system based on liberalism, materialism, progressivism, on the total alienation of the people and the extinction of local links. Individualism is the last word of liberalism, so we find, so we need to finish with the concept of individualism. Now, I think I know what he's getting at, having read the whole book, but his his open attack on words like or on concepts like the open society his open attack on human rights will alarm people to put it mildly um in the west now i know he has a particular angle on this he's not against human dignity he's not against people being treated justly or fairly but this rhetoric is going to rub people up the wrong way surely yes i think that's fair to say and what you read is the mi a mild example <laughs> to a certain extent, his rhetoric can be much fiercer where he calls supporters of, um, you know, LGBT and human rights and democracy and Americanism, you know, s Satanism and, you know, says um, he can be very fierce against them. But we need to understand, I think, the argument. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to understand exactly what it is that he's driving at. So I would I. I, first of all, he's right, I think, that in a world of liberal domination, if you oppose liberalism, you're instantly marked as a kind of enemy. You're liable yeah. to be canceled, you're liable to be fired, you're liable to be tarred and feathered, if yeah. not imprisoned and killed. So I think that's accurate. Yeah, absolutely. Now right. we have the question, how could anybody oppose human rights, for example, right? This, for some people, that's unthinkable. How could you oppose human rights Unless you're just like an authoritarian, dictatorial or, or uh, fascist, tyrant, or a fascist, which is what yeah, or a fascist, doing. or a fascist, exactly. Yeah. Well, in Dugan's presentation, this is crucial. I think it often gets missed, and it's hard to see, and it's not so easy to understand. But it is somehow the foundation here. The question is, what does it mean to be human? Now, this is a legitimate philosophical question. What is being human? What is the meaning of being human? Who's the human being? So, if you think that we uh, just are understood in terms of evolutionary biology, you'll have one kind of answer. Yeah. If you think that we are created by God, we have souls, 
know, we live before and after death in some way, that's a different kind of answer. Mm -hmm. And there are several others as well. It's an open question, who's the human being? Mm -hmm. I think that one of Dugan's main concerns with the global ideology of human rights is that it takes a single answer to the question, who's the human being? And it universalizes it in a way that, as we discussed earlier, the logic actually leads to an anti-human outcome, namely to post-humanism or transhumanism. So we have the universalization of a single answer to the question, who's the human being? An answer that, if driven to its conclusion, is the end of the human being. Now you say, number one, are there other answers that should be considered? Are there other ways to think about the human, the political community, social life, history, religion, God, and all of these things that are not automatically disrespectful, indecent, uh, a slight against human dignity, but that have somehow an equal right intellectually to exist as an answer to the question, who's the human being? Yeah. And that, in my view, is the deepest aspect of what the Great Awakening means for Dugan. The Great Awakening means somehow reawakening the question, who is the human being, in a way that doesn't lead to the destruction of the human being. So another way that I've liked to put this, it's been helpful for me, I think it's short and sweet and other people may find it helpful. There's more to being human than being liberal. So mm -hmm. if we take the liberal with his human rights and we say that's it, there's no option to that, we've actually amputated the human soul. We've cut out a large part of what it is to be human. It's like some form of, it's like, it's an existential crime against the human being to constrain it to a certain interpretation reducible to the ideology of global human rights. That's the kind of thinking that lies behind what Dugan is saying. Mm. What I think a lot of people, as you said, who uh, automatically, reactively oppose his formulations, what they think, what I think they think when he says that is like, Dugan wants to be able to just put everybody in jail without due process. Mm -hmm. Dugan wants to be able to just go around creating rivers of blood everywhere he goes. You know, he Dugan has no respect for people, for persons, for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not, I would say, you know, the conclusion to draw from his formulations. The conclusion is this one about debate over the meaning of human life and of our lives together in political communities and in, you know, glo global political order. Mm. Okay, now that I, I see that. that there's a deeper philosophical uh, uh, question here, and once understood in that context, then I think his his, his fiery rhetoric uh, is is made slightly more palatable. Although, uh, in reality, people are going to react to the superficial. They're going to see this rhetoric and go, "Oh, you know, he, he's he's against human rights." Uh, it, it, in spite of the explanation, the deeper understanding of the nature of the conception of humanity. That underpins his his views versus a different conception, which he's rejecting. Really, I, I think, uh, in terms of PR, if if one, if one can talk about such superficial things, having just, just sp spoken philosophically, it will surely backfire. I mean, it just takes the Americans, some Americans, I should say, to t take stuff in here out of context and just pump it around the airwaves. And hey, presto, you know. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things about that. So first, I want to be responsible for the fact that in Dugan's own self-understanding, the philosophical arguments always have a political or geopolitical correlate. So it's not like it's merely philosophical, merely conceptual. These conceptual philosophical differences do get expressed in geopolitical affairs. And for example, in things like wars and in real wars, real people die, real people's lives are destroyed. So I don't in any way want to downplay the actual real life significance of these disputes and treat them like they're merely philosophical hair splitting. In some sense, he's justifying actual wars against global liberalism, not just uh, intellectual wars mm -hmm. against global liberalism. So there's something there if you're like a pure pacifist or if you're, on, uh, you know, if you don't want to be uh, on the side that gets uh, attacked by the aggressor and all of these other reasons, there are legitimate, re there, there are legitimate grounds for not liking what Dugan has to say because of its consequences in real life politics. That's one thing. The other thing though, is that uh, in this book, Dugan points out correctly, I think, that it's not like, for example, America is the open society, Russia, China, Iran, and so on are the enemies of the open society. 
the line between the supporters and the enemies of the open society runs within America as well. Yeah. And I think that is quite obvious now, quite yeah. clear to see given the last few elections, given the political rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And you could understand then why there are some Americans who, when they hear certain of Dugan's ideas, okay, the supporters of the open society in America who hear Dugan's ideas react in the way that you suggested, mm -hmm. but the enemies of the open society in America who hear mm -hmm. Dugan's ideas resonate with some of them. Yes. And, you know, in yeah. a way that's exploited by the other side because they can say, well, you're agents of Putin, you know, how much is the Kremlin paying you to support these talking points? But look, let's take a very uh, exaggerated example. Imagine that on one hand, somebody supports the idea that a 10 year old child should be free to change their own gender identity with the support of doctors and uh, counselors and teachers and without the knowledge of the parents. I'm not saying there's a specific case like this. I'm taking an example and uh, exaggerating it for effect here. OK, even though there are cases, I think, that are not too, too dissimilar. Oh, no, there are cases are being like discussed. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So if you have the, you know, in terms of Dugan's model here, the supporters of that kind of surgery are representatives of the great reset and the opponents of that kind of procedure are representatives of the great awakening and as he says about the american case he says the americans don't know uh you know german philosophy islamic theology christian eschatology their reaction to the great the forces of the great reset are not mm -hmm. primarily philosophical no. they're somehow spontaneous instinctive. intuitive mm -hmm. instinctive exactly mm -hmm. now dugan wants to add that mm -hmm. there is a theoretical and philosophical layer to it, but he recognizes that in the American case, it's it's as you said, uh, spontaneous, and and still though you couldn't look at somebody in that example and say, you know, we don't think our children. It's kind of weird, you know, that a child has to be like whatever twenty one to drive and drink, but they can change their sexual identity with ir with irreversible medical procedures when they're twelve, and the parent can go to jail if he doesn't like it, and yeah. and if you oppose that and therefore are on the side of the Great Awakening in some sense, you yeah. get accused of as being a fascist and being yeah. on the same side as like, actually, you know. Michael, I mean, just to perhaps correct you slightly, there is actually an individual, I'm not gonna name who he is, I, I forget if it's in Canada or in the States or both, I think it involved both countries, who was actually sent to jail for objecting to uh, one of his siblings having this operation. This is not um, some kind of Orwellian fantasy. This has actually happened, past tense. I'm not going to mention his name, but I remember reading about it in several news articles. This has actually happened. It's not, it's not so, a, yeah. Yeah, so, and it's probably going to happen more and more. So now imagine you're in a situation like that. You're assessing it. You know, you read it in the newspaper or online, and you are on the side of the parent who didn't want the procedure, who didn't support it, who doesn't mm -hmm. think it's right for the child and who doesn't want to go along with it. And you can be accused of just on those grounds of being a fascist, of being, you know, basically everything gets lumped together. Yeah. If you're for the parents' rights, if you're for the, tra the traditional identity, if you're against this medical type of procedure, obviously mm -hmm. we're taking one case as an example here that you can extrapolate from. Yeah. That means you're on the side, you know, you're on the side of the global fascists. Now that yeah. is, Dugan says that's what's going to happen on the rhetorical plane. Anybody who opposes the basic principles and the exaggerated consequences of the Great Reset is going to be labeled a supporter of global fascism. Yeah. I think he's pretty much right about that. Yeah. And our task, in a way, is to... Uh, one of the reasons I think Dugan is so helpful, incidentally, not that he's blameless, needless to say, although a lot of people come at me as though that's what I think. One of the reasons he's so helpful is that he helps us to do these distinctions, the disambiguations, right? You can want to preserve the human essence against the forces that are looking to destroy it without really knowing, you know, whether you support Russia or China or Iran, but just because you recognize there's something important at stake that seems like it's threatened in a real way by forces that are running out of our control. So um, one of the things I noticed in uh, reading this book was um, uh I was going to say uh, Dugan's uh, description of a kind of a global alliance between different communities and nations and ethnicities and even um, with people within nations. So, for example, in the United States, he doesn't just see America as the 
the great uh, liberal evil that we must all as a global community oppose. Within America, he says, 50%, he, he says, of the people there are basically against the liberal globalist agenda. They voted for Trump after all. And even though Trump uh, was defeated, um, those same people remain with the same values and concerns they had before. And he sees these uh, uh, as having natural, uh, these peoples having um, similar values, although they're not articulated in sophisticated ideologies or philosophies, but this instinctive um, rejection of globalism, of, of woke values, of liberalism and so on, is shared by other groups and religions and, and, and nations across the world. So he sees, he wants to encourage a kind of global alliance. But I, I, and that's all well and good, um, I suppose. But what struck me was arguably the naivety of this. And let me show you what I mean. So he references the populist movements in Europe. Uh, recently, for example, he doesn't mention this because it postdates his book. Italy elected uh, what the, the liberal media are calling a far right uh, politician, a, a woman uh, uh, prime minister there, who has openly rejected uh, wokeism. She's pro family values. In France, we we saw uh, Marie Le, Le Pen nearly elected in the presidential election. She got the highest ever vote over against Macron, even though she lost. You know, it's the highest ever electoral success she's had. There's Hungary and so on. There's Sweden and so on. And but the thing is. He also mentions the, the Muslim world. He talks about Iran. He talks about Turkey, the resurgent kind of uh, identity of Erdogan there with, with the Islamic identity coming to the forefront, which is true. But then I thought but the populism we see in the West with Trumpism in the States and the European populist movements are all profoundly anti-Muslim. These aren't just anti-woke. They hate Muslims, I, I, or they appear to sometimes. They're very anti-Muslim. Um, certainly the new Italian prime minister, I, I've seen some videos of her campaigning against mosques and, and bemoaning Muslims in Italy. So they're not exactly allies, are they? I mean, yes, they may share s s uh, similar concerns coincidentally, but it's hard to see that they could possibly cooperate except coincidentally in similar campaigns but that in any way seeing themselves as allies at all and he didn't seem to say that he just didn't say well we all share these common interests so let's get together and fight against liberals but but within the opposition here that there, there is a real antagonism uh, don't you think uh, yeah, I think that's fair to say, and I'm sure Dugan recognizes it, but his main idea is that that antagonism can be exploited by global liberalism, and it also needs to be set aside if there is to be a prospect of a legitimate and effective response to global liberalism. So that is his argument. I mean, on one hand, the possibility of the exploitation, and on the other hand, the need to find models that allow these allies of the Great Awakening, so to speak, each in their own way, to not see each other as enemies. So he's, you could say, presenting an exhortation to the various factions of anti-globalists mm. to find a common ground, because mm. without a common ground, you won't overcome globalism. And without a common ground, you allow yourself to be manipulated by globalism. Sometimes the uh, sometimes America in Dugan's telling, for example, will uh, elevate a nationalism or elevate an extremism or elevate a particular movement. Even if, for example, Americanism is anti-nationalistic, it may use a nationalism for its purposes. So all of those kinds of machinations uh, become easier to affect if you have these various schisms. So now we have a question like, how is it possible to take groups that in principle, share opposition to a globalism, but still have these inner frag fragmentation, still have this inner fragmentation or still opposed to one another. How mm. is it possible to offer them anything like a common ground? Indeed. Well, I think that is the do that is the question that Dugan opposes. And that's the question that he tries to answer, in my view. Uh, people may think he does so successfully or not, with, you know, by offering people the ideas of the fourth political theory, the ideas of a theory of a multipolar world, and several other ideas. Let me give you an example. We've discussed how it seems like the meaning of being human is at stake in the conflict between the forces of the Great Reset and the forces of the Great Awakening. 
So Dugan says, okay, that's a kind of shared ground. We're all trying to keep something human in play. And there's a, all of the traditions, religious and philosophical, have some expression of what that is. So he tries to look to, for example, uh, various uh, Islamic thinkers in, Shi in Shiism, and he does a sort of mapping from Heidegger over to their tradition and says, look, here's their account of the radical subject of the deep human essence. Here's the Western European account of the radical subject, the deep human essence. Here's the Russian account. Here's this account, this account. So mm -hmm. at some level, it's kind of like, I mean, this is an oversimplification, but let me see if this helps um, map out what he's aiming at. So you have this fragmented, uh, fractured layer of opposition to global liberalism. You yep. take it one step down and you have the specific uh, internecine debates or whatever, pro-Islamic, anti-Islamic, pro-nationalist, imperialist. His yep. idea is take it a step further and try to find what's the sh what's shared, what's common, and what can, sometimes it'll be tactical. It won't necessarily be always deeply theoretical, mm -hmm. but that's that's the nature of his, uh, that's the nature of his argument. And he specifically says, as you saw, but for the benefit of people who haven't uh, read it yet or had a look at it, he says, at several points, for example, we need to make sure that we've trained not only a class of philosophers, a theologians, like a holy priesthood, basically, of anti-globalism. You mm. also have to take into account the warrior class and mm. the warrior class across the whole playing field. And you have to sort of teach the warrior class or educate the warrior class to understand that they're not at war with each other. So Dugan is engaged in a project, maybe successful, maybe not, maybe laudable, maybe not, of orienting all of the forces at play <laughs> against a common opponent. Mm. There's more to gain in setting aside the these little animosities in order to deal with the big one than there is to not deal with the big one because you're too caught up in the little ones. Now, mm. maybe that's too utopian, maybe it can't happen, you know, maybe there are too many obstacles along the way, but that's his uh, intention so far as I can uh, so far as I can tell. Yeah, I suppose the principle, you know, my enemy's enemy is my friend would be the operational thing there, kind of minimalist, you know, okay, well, we don't necessarily like you or agree with you, my person who I share strategic interests with, but because you, the enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, we will work together on this particular project. But that doesn't mean, though, That's that we're in any way going to be friends. No, no, it doesn't. But there are other kinds of operations that he does. Again, they may be accepted or rejected. So instead of saying, I'll give you a, a simple, probably too simple example, but still, instead of saying, uh, you know, Christians are the enemy or Jews are the enemy or Muslims are the enemy or this is the enemy. Just like we saw in the case of the United States, you had the forces of the open society and the enemies of the open society running through, right, dividing it up. Yep. So too here, he sometimes says, like in the Islamic world, there are some players who seem to be allied with the, it's not that they're, well, in this book, what he says is that the Islamic world as such is predisposed to be against the Great Reset. Mm. Okay, but in some other contexts, in some other cases where he's using some other divisions, he says, for example, that, um, you know, a, a Wahhabism, is employed by the forces of Western Atlanticism. Whereas there are like uh, uh, Shia movements that are much more aligned to a Eurasian or a multipolar mentality. You know, there are some tendencies in Islam that are cl more closely aligned with political modernity and mm -hmm. other tendencies that are more closely aligned with the mystical or traditional interpretation of things. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you a, I'll give you an example. I know maybe maybe your listeners will or won't find this interesting, but like Martin Heidegger is an important thinker for Dugan. He's called him the deepest foundation of his fourth political theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dugan sometimes does this operation that moves us from Heidegger to Islamic thought in the following way. He has uh, Henri Corbin who I understand was the first to translate fragments of Heidegger into French, but who was also a scholar of Iranian uh, mysticism and who wrote books, for example, on Ibn Arabi and on these medieval accounts of the mundus imaginalis, of the sort of intermediary world. So you have a physical world, you have a sort of divine realm, and then you have an intermediary realm of images, kind of a realm of prophecy. And so he's able to go from an interest in Heidegger through to an account of um, Islamic mysticism using this intermediary figure, Henri Corbin. And he's always doing that kind of thing. How can we take the structure that we just mapped out as it applies to Western Europe or to Russia or to Germany or wherever and 
give it a multipolar dimension. Mm -hmm. Let it tell us something about the Islamic world, about the you know South America, about uh, Ch about China, about Africa, and so on. So he's trying to bring out. He may succeed or not, but the intention I think is to show people there is a common interest that we have, a common existential interest, not only geopolitical, although partially geopolitical, but primarily in some sense, spiritual, religious, moral, uh, psychological, historical. And that interest is making sure that you don't get destroyed by that universal projection of Western European political modernity. Mm -hmm. um, so some people may take that up or, uh, or not. And let me just say one more thing super quickly is that yeah, yeah. there are some nationalists, European nationalists and other nationalists who they seemingly take a stance against global liberalism by asserting the primacy of the nation and its traditions. One thing that's not so easy to see for people who are newcomers to Dugan is that he is not a nationalist and he recognizes that nationalism can sometimes be exploited by the mm -hmm. hegemonic imperialist forces. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like, in some sense, nationalism is not enough for him. He likes big civilizational blocks because small nationalisms are not sovereign enough to really assert themselves outside of the gravitational pull of the real bearers of sovereignty in the world. I, so uh, I think, I, think yeah. I might just push back on that. He might not be a nationalist in the narrow sense because his understanding of Russia, as far as I can understand from his book, is not that Russia is just a nation, that it's an imperium, it's an empire, and it's much more than just a narrow sectarian ethno-nationalist ethno -nationalist right. nationalist state. Therefore, it would be accurate, perhaps, to say, I'm looking at the last section of The Great Awakening, this book, Russia Awakening, an imperial renaissance. He's an imperial um, nationalist, I suppose, if that such a term exists. Um, he's yes. all for the renaissance uh, of of um, of Russia, and and this this comes in perhaps into the last section really, where, where, where unavoidable given what's going on in the world at the moment, there's a relationship, the intellectual or uh, other relationship of um, Dugan with Putin himself, and I, I know there are a lot of tropes in the Western media which are you know frankly a bit silly, you know Putin's brain and all that, um, but he doesn't he doesn't actually as far as I'm aware hold any. Uh, Dugan doesn't hold any official office in the Kremlin. He's not a government spokesman. He's not part of the cabinet or anything. He's he's like an independent thinker, if that's the right word. But what is the relationship, if only intellectual, between Dugan and Putin? And how much of this uh, of Dugan's project is endangered by the fortunes or misfortunes of Putin himself? And of course, brackets, Ukraine, etc. Because you know, he's not living in an ivory tower. This guy, uh, Dugan, is dealing with real world events. And at the moment, I, I, mean, I, don't know, I don't know what's really going on. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But if things turn out badly for Putin, who knows what will happen to Dugan? Yeah, that's right. So let me say a few things. The first one is that there is a kind of history of Dugan's institutional influence, by which I mean he met with such and such a party leader. He helped with such and such a platform. He was invited to speak here or there in government circles. The best account that I know of, or the one that I enjoyed the most at any rate, is in Charles Clover's book, Black Wind, White Snow. And then you can see, for example, Dugan helped to write the platform of the Russian, um, of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. Uh, and he influenced these other figures. So that's the that's at the level of like in direct institutional influence. He mm -hmm. met with this person, this person met with this person. but. Okay. I think that is, for me at any rate, less important and less interesting than a different kind of influence that intellectuals can exert on holders of power. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that Dugan has over 30 odd years and 50 odd books articulated a vision for a world in which Russia can assert its civilizational independence and sovereignty. The various dimensions of that, including what it would mean for international order, what it means for understanding the history of the West, what it means philosophically, sociologically, ethno-sociologically, etc. That's what he's written about. So now you ask the question, what's his influence on Russia? And I would put it this way, that whenever Putin decides to act as though Russia is a civilization and not just a, you know, a country in the global order, then 
somehow automatically the ideas that are going to be there for him to draw on whether because he's aware of them directly or indirectly maybe because they've percolated over 30 years through a variety of authors uh, think tanks and institutions or just because dugan has prepared the conceptual field so that as soon as somebody starts thinking what would it mean for russia to go against the west what are the key concepts the key words the key policies the rhetoric the ideas and the ideologies he's the one who has prepared that field and it just starts raining down so to speak so um dugan has in that sense provided the true north for a russia that wants to break from the west without doing it as a nation as in small nation like you said without doing it in ethno-nationalist terms and without doing it in terms of the re rejected ideologies of the past mm. another way like dugan has sometimes said why what is he's he, he doesn't answer the question whether he knows putin whether he's met with him and so on he, he doesn't mm. answer that question when he's asked in interviews well, 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 him, michael why doesn't he answer that question i mean what look he's not answering it is evasive and that suggests why is he not answering that question yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not going to speculate. But I'll tell you that what he does say is that as somebody who's analyzed the trends of global politics and of Russian history, mm. he says he sees further ahead on the basis of the logical extrapolation of the meaning of Russia's history. And so when Putin acts consistently with that, it's going to look like he's walking in lockstep to a certain extent with Dugan's ideas. Wow. And it's not always the case. So Dugan has a book called Putin versus Putin where he said that Putin is Eurasian by half. He's, he stopped Russia from collapsing. He, he made Russia strong again, okay? He did all kinds of things to restore the possibility of Russia's civilizational sovereignty in the world. This is before the war, okay? But he's surrounded by all kinds of liberal uh, Putin whisperers, and he sometimes thinks that Russia is a European country. So this book, Putin versus Putin, said there are these two Putins, and he hasn't yet decided which one of them. Maybe that's his only place in Russian history is that he restored the possibility. But now I think Putin, in some sense, has crossed the Eurasian Rubicon, and he has fully put Russia on the path of Russian civilization. Yeah against the West, that seems clear from his recent speeches, yeah. particularly from the speech of the annexation of the Ukrainian regions, is clear for anybody who watches that, that the anti-Western rhetoric is now Very strong. quite, uh, Very strong. right, it's yeah. been dialed up. So yeah. in that sense, Putin versus Putin has been resolved, right? If it was like Eurasian Putin versus Western Putin, we now see, oh, it's the Eurasian Putin. So the real risk, I would say, to Dugin, um, you know, if we ask the question that you asked, right, what what can we infer about Dugan's fortunes as a function of Putin's fortunes? Yeah. If Russia, and Dugan seems to be pretty uh, aware of this, if the current Russian war or special military operation is a failure, mm. in other words, you know, if it's a victory for a unipolar world, if it's a victory yeah. for Western Europe, if it's a victory for nationalism, U Ukrainian nationalism, if it's a defeat of Russia's attempt at a multipolar world that would be a big blow for dugan uh to the vision that he thinks that war is currently supporting you know in other words that would be like a that would be a hard hit for dugan and for russia to take in his yeah. view if yeah. it's, so he sometimes has talked about the current uh war special military operation like if like it's a matter of life and death for a eurasian russia if russia loses it's going to be a big big problem and a lot of people obviously it's the opposite for them it's not a big problem it would be like an, it would be the best thing that could happen for them so that just shows you that there's a debate and a dispute about you know what not only what will happen but the meaning of what will happen mm -hmm. so uh in that sense because of because putin took a step you could put it this way because the recent special military operation or war was putin taking a step closer to dugan's vision of russia and its place in the world Therefore, Putin's loss is all the more Dugin's, the loss of Dugin's vision, if that's how it plays out. And vice versa, a yeah. Russian win, however interpreted. And again, I don't say this as someone who's celebrating either side. I don't say this with any disrespect to the combatants. I don't say this with any disrespect to the people who are losing friends and family on both sides, because I always, uh, there's always the possibility for misinterpretation here, where people think I'm... Um, personally celebrating or lamenting the death of their friends and families nothing could be further from the truth but the fact is the meaning of the war is in dispute here and 
its meaning for world order and world history is clearly both for liberal Democrats and for Russian Eurasianists uh, a fascinating ideological question. Does this mean democracy and freedom triumphant again? Does it mean the force, the dark forces of authoritarian tyranny triumphant again? Or does it mean something like what Dugan is imagining here, a step in the direction of the Great Awakening? Um, that's how we can set out the problem and then people have to see for themselves what they think. So just a, a seemingly local conflict in you, you, Ukraine actually has uh, potentially huge civilizational geopolitical consequences uh, going for not just the Dugan, of course, but for uh, the rest of the world. So it's a momentous uh, moment that we're, we're living in, clearly. Yeah, and the Western intellectuals seem to agree with that, with that presentation, that the moral nature of the world order is at stake in that conflict. It's not just the regional conflict. It's mm. a conflict over, again, the meaning of uh, the meaning of, of history. It's kind of like if you had the end of history with the victory of global liberalism, Russia is trying to reverse that and a Ukrainian win would make sure that that reversal is like, um, you know, doesn't happen. Right. The mm -hmm. the corpse tried to get out of the the corpse tried to get out of the grave and you put it back, you buried it again. That's how some Western intellectuals see what's at stake here. Gosh, extraordinary. Um, just my very last question, if I may. We've talked about a number of books by Dugan. This is obviously his most recent one. Uh, this is the the classic text, the fourth physical theory. I'm always very intrigued by the the uh, icon or the illustration here. What exactly does it mean? Is quite uh, the symbolism there is quite striking. Uh, and this is your doctoral dissertation, beginning with uh, Heidegger. And there are others, of course, uh, that I haven't mentioned. Many others. But what book would you, Michael, recommend to a, a Western or a global audience uh, who are not familiar with Dugan's work, uh, who, but who want to get acquainted with it? What would be a good way into the mind of Dugan, uh, do you think? Well, the shortest one that is a fair representation of what he thinks is the one we've been discussing. I think it right. gives you some outline of the fourth political theory, some sense of how he mixes high minded philosophical themes with mm -hmm really um, fiery political rhetoric. Mm. So you can see the combination in this volume, right? He talks about uh, Aristotle's active intellect on some pages. And then, mm. you know, a page later, he's accusing the West of global Satanism or whatever the case is. So you get a sense of all the various registers yeah. of Dugan's yeah. writing in this book. Otherwise, for sure, the fourth political theory and the companion volume, The Rise yeah. of the Fourth Political Theory, right. people who are just interested in the geopolitics, there's a book called uh, Last War of the World Island, Contemporary Geopolitics of Contemporary Russia. Uh, sorry, Geopolitics of Contemporary Russia. He's got a few books on ethnosociology for people who want to think about, you know, what does Dugan think about race, ethnicity, peoplehood? Those volumes on ethnosociology are good. He's got a book in English on Heidegger. So it's all good. But if you need, I mean, it's all worth reading for people who want to know what he thinks. But the starting point would probably be uh, this book, The Fourth Political Theory. And I could also recommend Theory of a Multipolar World. Okay, but I, I would also add to your, your recommendations, of course, a couple of things. Uh, firstly, your online school, uh, millermanschool.com, which I'll link to in the description below, where Michael offers courses on uh, Plato, Aristotle, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Strauss, Dugan, and others as well. So you can learn about Dugan and uh, other eminent Western philosophers. And also I'll link to Michael's uh, frankly fascinating website. I, I wouldn't say that. He really is uh, a very well uh, produced website in the description below uh, with lots of goodies there if you want to um, follow up on essays and so on. He has a YouTube, you've got a YouTube channel, of course, which is worth looking at where you uh, you actually interview Dugan, I think, don't you, on one or, uh, uh, yes, one or that's two right. of them? Uh, in English, I, I'm glad to say. Um, so you can see the man himself uh, talking with Michael um, and uh, Dugan actually speaks uh, surprisingly good English. I say surprising because he speaks many languages, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah, he's certainly um, a thinker to take very seriously, whether or not one likes what he says or agrees with everything he says. Uh, I found some of his political insights to be uh, rather extraordinary and helpful even. Uh, I, I very much enjoyed um, his etiology of liberalism, going back to the nominalism of William of Ockham. Um, I thought that was really uh, brilliantly done. Uh, initially, I was skeptical, but on reflection, I think he is on to something. But his rhetoric, I think, will continue to um, alienate some people by the very nature of rhetoric. It's going to attract some and maybe alienate others. He's clearly a divisive figure. Uh, and because of his close connections to the Putin, uh, to Putin himself and the Putin government, he 
uh, he will continue to be uh, blacklisted. And um, you mentioned that you can't even translate some of his works now because of the he's been blacklisted in the West. So, you know, he's not just a philosopher, he's a political actor on the global scene. And, you know, he's paying the price uh, for that. But um, also, I, I do recommend we, we become acquainted with his thought, if only to understand him better and understand uh, Putin better, perhaps. Um, so I guess that, do you have any last words at all, Michael, before we conclude? No, just thanks for the invitation. I'm glad we had a chance to discuss this. I hope your listeners and viewers also find something valuable in it. And, uh, you know, we can never be expected to agree 100% with everything an intelligent interpreter of world events says, but um, it's our task to go through it and see what's what's valuable, what's not, what is helpful, what's not, what's exaggerated, what's clear. And for sure, Dugan has something to offer us that just can't be dismissed. Mm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that uh, conclusion. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thank you very much indeed, Michael, for your, your time, your expertise, your lucidity, which uh, makes such a big difference, uh, whether it's talking about Heidegger or or anyone, uh, this is one of your defining characteristics is the clarity, conceptual clarity, you're able to communicate with the audience and bring us along and not just alienate us with lots of jargon that kind of, well, what are you talking about? So I, I do appreciate your teaching ability to communicate complex ideas to a wider audience. So thank you for that, Michael. Thank you. Until next time. <laughs>